Hey, uh, I want to ask you a question. What if, what if God came up to you or somebody and said, I'm going to give you a blank check. You can ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And then that person said, you know what? What I want more than anything else is I want wisdom. More than long life or riches or, you know, satisfaction in my life. I just want to live a life that's wise. You imagine what kind of a life that person would live if God granted it to him. And this is not really just a what-if scenario. It's what happened with a guy by the name of Solomon. Solomon reigned somewhere between uh, 930 to 970 uh, BC, and uh, he was uh, known as the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, Solomon ruled the country of Israel, and he ruled Israel in a time when Israel was at the absolute peak of its glory. Those of you who know your Bible well will know that there was only a short period of time where there was a united monarchy of Israel, where the whole of the country was united under kings. And the three kings were Saul and David and Solomon. And with each one of these kings, the power got stronger and uh, the kingdom grew and the wealth grew and the knowledge of them grew. And David did a lot to be able to bring the kingdom together. Well, it was really Solomon who rode the wave of his father's good choices and his father's military conquests and spread the territory to its broadest amount accumulated more wealth than anyone ever accumulated, built the temple of God that they worshipped in for generations afterwards. This was all what Solomon did. And because of Solomon's immense wisdom, wise men and scholars and princes and queens from around the Middle East and from around Africa, as far away as Ethiopia, would travel to Israel just to meet Solomon and sit under his teachings and listen to his wisdom. This is what it says about Solomon's wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 4. It says, Solomon's wisdom surpassed all the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He's taken his sayings and the sayings of a few other people and put them together in the book that we call now the book of Proverbs. Now, it would have hundreds of the sayings of Solomon, plus some sayings from a guy named Agur and another one named Lemuel and an anonymous group of people called the wise. And Proverbs 31, nobody even really knows who wrote that. But the best scholarship would indicate that Solomon was the one who was the collector of his sayings and other wise sayings of his day, and he put them together in this book that we now call the book of Proverbs. Now, as you read through the book of Proverbs, one of the things that you'll notice is that the first three chapters of Proverbs are all dedicated to encouraging people to pursue wisdom, to go after this hard. These are the benefits of wisdom. So for our first message, we're just going to talk about wisdom and the pursuit of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, that's where we're going to be sitting uh, for the main part of today. If you don't know how to get to Proverbs in your Bible, just open it up about halfway through. You'll likely land in the Psalms, and then go one book to the right, and then that's the book of Proverbs right there. So it's Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and it says this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight... For acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So Solomon wrote these for a reason. And it says in verse 2 exactly what that reason is. For attaining wisdom and discipline and understanding words of insight. That's what the book of Proverbs was written for. So what is wisdom? And how is it that you gain wisdom? How do you acquire wisdom? Well, wisdom is the ability or it's that which helps you to make good decisions when all the moral rules don't apply. Okay? It's that which helps you to make good decisions when all the moral rules don't apply. Oftentimes, the decisions that you make are moral decisions. And usually with moral decisions, it may not be easy to actually do the moral action, 
but it's usually easy to know what the right action should be. Like, for instance, should I steal my neighbor's American Girl doll collection? You know, not a hard decision. Should I sleep with a man who's not my husband? If I pass a car wreck, should I stop and help uh, the people that I just saw get in a car wreck? All of those decisions are moral decisions, and they're actually fairly simple to decide what the right answer is. But the vast majority of the decisions that you make in life are not moral decisions. They're decisions that need not a moral application, but a wisdom application. I'd say somewhere around 80%, just to give it a number, to give it a hook, of the decisions that you make are not moral in character. They're decisions that need wisdom to be able to drive them. Uh, questions like, how do I prioritize my time? What college should I attend? How should I discipline my kids? What should I look for in relationships? How do I evaluate my employees? How much should I brag about the fighting of Illini of the University of Illinois given how lame their record has been the last couple of years? How should I respond when Uncle Chuck says, pull my finger? You know, all these questions, you need wisdom to know how to respond to each of these kinds of questions. So I want to ask you a question. How many of you, for something that's going on in your life, for, you know, your relationships, for your future, for your finances, for decisions that need to be made, how many people here would say, I need wisdom for something right now in my life? I would love to have the wisdom of God on some issue I'm dealing with. Raise your hand if that's true for you. I need wisdom in my life. Most of us would say that almost every day of our life, that we're facing something that needs wisdom. So the smart thing for us to do is to accumulate wisdom all along the way in life so that when we get to the point where those decisions have to be made, we have wisdom that has been gained and is available at our fingertips. The Proverbs would indicate that if you decide to walk down the path of wisdom, if you follow Solomon's advice, you'll be healthier, safer, smarter, more fulfilled, more joyful, wealthier, more successful in friendship, family, business, and love. Not bad, eh? It's a pretty good promise in the book of Proverbs. It says that if you've got a good life and you're already living according to wisdom, your good life can be better. And if your life has gone down a wrong course, if you've gotten off a, a, a wrong track, and you're heading in a direction that's taking your life south, the Proverbs say, it's not too late to apply wisdom to your life. Do it right now, and you can get back on the right track towards the success that you need. Wisdom can always be applied to your life. Now, in verse 4, it talks about who wisdom is for. Who wisdom is for? For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Watch for these characters as you read through the book of Proverbs. As you read through, you'll find three characters that show up again and again. They're personified uh, characters. And one of them is the simple. And the simple will show up over and over. Now, the simple is not necessarily someone who's dumb or foolish. It's somebody who's just naive. They just haven't learned yet. Oftentimes, the simple are in parallel with people who are young. They haven't gained the wisdom yet, and so they need to gain wisdom. And uh, the simple uh, learn along the way. The second character that there is, is the fool. And the fool is not noted in chapter 1, but you'll see him all over the place. The fool is somebody who has had access to wisdom, but has ignored that wisdom and chosen to go down a different path. And you'll notice that the book of Proverbs isn't addressed to somebody who is the fool, because the writer of the book of Proverbs knows that the fool will disregard that wisdom anyway. But it is addressed to the third group of people. And that third group of people is the wise. Because the wise realize that I have never gained enough wisdom in my life. I'm, a path, I'm on a path where I'm constantly accumulating more and more wisdom, and I can add to that as time goes on. Those are the people who are there. Now, there is a correlation between wisdom and age. Being around the block a lot of times, seeing crazy, sticky situations, learning more as your life goes on and accumulating ideas and thoughts and experiences and relationships, all of that will add to your wisdom bucket if you'll let it. But even though there's a correlation between wisdom and age, there's not necessarily a causation between age and wisdom. Just because you're old doesn't mean that you're wise. There can be old wise men and there can be old fools as well. But as you walk down a path of wisdom or a path of foolishness, the results of your choices throughout life become more and more obvious 
the older that you get. Now, wisdom, throughout the book of Proverbs, you'll notice, is talked about as a path that you're walking on. A path that you're walking on. There's the path that could be a good path, or it could be an evil path, a path of foolishness that you should avoid. The first place that it comes up is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 15, where the writer, Solomon in this case, says, My son, don't go along with them. Don't set foot on their paths. He's talking about some foolish guys. Don't get hooked up with those guys and don't walk on their paths. And then again in chapter 2, verse 9, he talks about a good path to be on. Then you will understand what is just and right and fair, every good path. 31 times in the 31 chapters of Proverbs, the idea of a path as the analogy for wisdom comes up. Always a path, never a door. Never is the word door used as an analogy for wisdom. Because it's not the case that wisdom is something that you simply turn the handle and walk through, you get to the other side and you're wise. It's not the way that wisdom works. It's not a download, it's not a lightning bolt, it doesn't happen all of a sudden. Wisdom, in contrast to the door, is a path. Wisdom is a path. Now a path, quite honestly, can be boring. It can be mundane. It can be slow moving going on a path. It's not a rocket ship kind of a flight. And if you're to talk about what a path is like, it's a lot like this. Right, left, right, left, right, left. Not really interesting, but one step at a time as you walk down the path of wisdom, you'll find yourself getting closer and closer to the kind of life that God wants you to lead. You get closer and closer to living a successful life. But wisdom doesn't happen all of a sudden in a crisis moment. Wisdom happens in the accumulation of small right choices. The teaching of Proverbs is that every attitude, every conversation, every choice yields a particular result. Or more likely, it yields a field of results. And handling yourself right does a few things. One is it weaves a character inside of you that enables you to make good choices in crisis or difficult or bigger conversations. Making right choices affects all the people that are around you. And when you affect the people around you, their lives are changed and it affects the lives of the people around them. And if you move this trajectory out for years or even for generations, the effect of small choices on life right now can yield consequences that make a massive difference for generations to come. Small choices now, Big differences later. It's the teaching of wisdom. Tim Keller gives an example of a young boy who, uh, of actually a man he talked to, but when that man was a young boy, earlier on in his life, at 10 years old, he was messing around in his father's bedroom and accidentally knocked his father's watch off of the dresser. It hit the tile ground and the face of the watch cracked. And instead of taking ownership and responsibility, the boy decided that he would take his father's watch and hide it in the dresser drawer. That when he hid it in his father's dresser drawer, he'd run away. Well, his father, of course, discovered the watch and he gathered all of the kids together and he asked them who did it. All of the kids denied that they, in fact, did it. And in this episode, this little boy got off scot-free. He never got caught. He chose to hide and not take responsibility and was able to not experience consequences. And it started a pattern in his life of hiding and not taking responsibility. So much so that when he was 19 years old, he was driving his car a little bit too fast down a side street. A little kid ran in front of his car. And he hit that kid and killed the kid on impact. But instead of staying and taking responsibility and waiting for the ambulance to come, He ran away and tried to hide, hoping that nobody would find him, but the police did find him. And Tim Keller met him in jail, where he was serving decades' worth of sentences for not only the actions that he did, but for running away from his actions as well. See, small choices mold a character that have big consequences later in life. His decision didn't just happen in the moment. It was molded by years of decision-making throughout his life on a much smaller scale. Same thing could be said on a positive side of a 10-year-old kid who says, hey, I'm going to give my life towards studying well, accumulating knowledge, and instead of becoming great at video games or watching TV, I'll become great at my academics. That kind of a kid will rise to the top of his class. 
And over time, perhaps you would say, I'm going to make good choices in my high school years academically, give my life towards compassion and justice and serving the needs of the poor on a volunteer basis. <coughs> that molds the kind of character and academics that would get him into Princeton University. And in that time, he's able to accelerate it even on a larger scale. Get a job as a lawyer, then later on, get a job as a judge, and maybe eventually be promoted to a Supreme Court justice. But the person who becomes a Supreme Court justice doesn't get there by accident. It's because they've made tens of thousands of good choices throughout their life to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing, and eventually they wind up in a position of influence. This is how wisdom works on the small things, day by day, that yield big results. Well, if you skip down to verse 6, it talks about what the Proverbs are all about. It says, These are for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. Now, those of you who have been paying attention to the publicity for the series realize that that, Sayings and Riddles of the Wise, is the title of our series. And we've chosen it because if you look at the Proverbs, some of the Proverbs are like a two-by-four or a kick in the pants. You just look at them, you know exactly what they mean and exactly how to apply them in your life. But others of them are a bit more mysterious. They're parables. They have layers of understanding. They need to be unwrapped and unpacked and figured out. They're more like riddles that you don't get unless you look at them from multiple angles. These are how the Proverbs work, and these are also why Proverbs were, were designed to be learned in community. Now, it's very likely, scholars say, that the book of Proverbs was compiled in order to be able to be used in a boy's school for training. It's likely Proverbs that Solomon said to his sons, but also for a boy's school of wisdom. And in this school, it's likely that there would be one or two older men, maybe one of the kids' dads, that would gather together in small groups, read the Proverbs together, and then discuss the application of those Proverbs to real everyday life. Because wisdom is not just the accumulation of information. Wisdom happens best in community in applying information to the decisions that have to be made. And most Americans would prefer not to have the hard work of community and gain wisdom. Most Americans would just prefer to give me the information, download it into me. Information can be found easily. Information can be found from a Google search or can be found from a classroom or a how-to book. This week I checked Amazon.com to find out just how many books have how-to in the title. And when I did my search for how-to books, 515,000 results came up. 515,000. The favorite of all those results of mine was how to survive a garden gnome attack. <laughs> how to ditch your ferry, how to stop sliding down an ice-covered mountain. You know, things you experience in everyday life that you want answers to. You can find how-tos just about anywhere. But wisdom, wisdom is really only found in community. And this is why journey groups are so important to our church. You need to be in a group of people that will speak into your life, that will know your situation, know your relationships, be able to talk to you about how to live life in a wise way. This is why I love the idea of intergenerational journey groups as well, where the leaders of the group are wiser and older, been around the block a few times, and they can speak into the lives of young people. I've noticed an interesting trend from time to time as I talk to folks who are in the empty nest stage of their life where they say, you know what, for so many years I've been giving myself towards uh, my kids and towards the youth group activities and things that are happening at church that surround them and their friends, parents, and so forth. Now that I've hit the empty nester stage, I'm not really sure what my best contribution is towards the church or towards the kingdom. One great, or at the same time, these same people are saying, you know, I'm praying for my kids that are now moving to places like Chicago and Denver and Minneapolis, and I'm praying that when they land in those places, there will be somebody wise who will speak into their lives and help them to be able to make good decisions in their 20s and 30s. Well, you know, at the same time, there are lots of parents that live in Chicago and Minneapolis and Denver whose kids are moving to Omaha, and those parents are praying, God, would you help there to be some wise person that will invest in my kids during their 20s and 30s when I can't be close by? And some of these journey groups have been popping up with someone in their 50s and 60s and a group of younger people in their 20s and 30s. And oh man, it's been a great formula to help guide these uh, emerging families 
as they face the challenges of their life. And maybe one of your big applications from the book of Proverbs is to get into one of these kinds of groups so that you can learn in community. Another thing that we're going to be doing to help learn in community is we're taking you through a challenge. It's our Proverbs 31-day challenge. Uh, Of course, there are 31 days in the month of May, and there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. So we're challenging you to read a chapter a day during the month of May, and just go ahead and start today and begin reading uh, the book of Proverbs. And what I'll do is I'll start uh, putting video blogs on my site on the internet. And I'll give you little three-minute devotions every day, and you can go to my blog on the internet and get a little nugget of truth from that chapter of Proverbs, as well as some tips on interpreting the Proverbs and uh, using that type of literature responsibly. Uh, You'll enjoy those little video blogs. So you read one chapter a day, check out the tips on the internet, and then when we run into each other in community, when we hang out with one another in small groups or in grocery stores or wherever we meet each other, we'll have some common basis to talk about from what we read today or yesterday in our time in God's Word, being in the same position at the same place. It will enable us to learn in community, which is the way that wisdom is formed. So finally, we have verse four, or our last verse is verse 7. Okay, verse 7. And it tells us what the first step down the path of wisdom looks like. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools divide, despise wisdom and discipline. Throughout the Proverbs, you'll find that the fear of the Lord is the starting place of wisdom. Listen to these, Proverbs chapter 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. Proverbs chapter 10. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Proverbs 14. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Isn't that good? The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. So what is this fear of the Lord? It's not the idea of God is after me, God's going to hurt me, please don't hit me, God. Instead, it's the idea of standing in an awesome fear and reverence of the one who is the center of the universe, of the one who wrote the very laws of the universe around which the wise person tries to align themselves. It's much like a pilot. He stands in awe and reverence of the law of gravity, if he's a smart pilot, because he realizes that large hunks of metal have a tendency to move toward planet Earth, not away from planet Earth. But he also understands the laws of aerodynamics and that the laws of aerodynamics can trump the laws of gravity if they're all working right. And so he lives in accordance with the laws of aerodynamics and the laws of gravity in order to fly a plane from point A to point B. As you fly your life, you need to align your life with the deep laws that have been written into the code of the universe. Just like God wrote the laws of gravity and aerodynamics, so he's written laws related to morality and wisdom and decision-making and spiritual truth around which we must align ourselves. So the big question of the day is, do you know how the deep laws of God work? Do you begin by standing in awe and respect of him and his intelligence in this world? Because not everybody does. Not everybody respects God as prime reality. Anytime any person constructs a worldview, their grid through which they understand reality, there is one most important question that must be asked. And that's the question, what is prime reality? What is the really real? When you strip everything else away, what is it that's left at the very end? And people answer this question very differently. The French philosopher René Descartes one time sat himself down in the middle of a room and he began doubting things. And he tried to figure out how many things he could doubt and eventually he began to doubt everything except the fact that he was sitting in a room doubting. And then he came up with the famous question, I think, or the famous statement, I think, therefore, I am. And for him, prime reality is his own thoughts. That's what's the most fundamental thing in the universe. There are other people, when I spend a lot of time in the university context, there are other people who would say that it's time, space, matter, and energy. That's all that there is. That's all the dimensions that exist. That's all that there ever was and all that there ever will be. And of course, it's very difficult to answer with satisfaction some of the deep questions of life, if that's your philosophy. Like, why is there something rather than nothing? 
Where does morality come from? Is intelligence really real? What's going to happen to me after I die? There are some people who would take that even a step farther and say, I will only believe what can be proven by science. When we say that, I want to say, really? You realize that that statement, I will only believe what can be proven by science, can't be proven by science? Making it very difficult to believe. It blows up on itself. Or another person who says, you can't really know anything about God anyway. The person who says that, I go, really? Because in order to make that statement, you need to know all available knowledge of every person and everything that could be known in the universe. And my guess is you probably don't have that level of knowledge. There's lots of options for what you could say when it comes to what is prime reality, but really there's only one that's truly satisfying, intellectually consistent, and personally verifiable. It's the idea that God is the foundation of everything. It's really, really important to get this right. That the center of your life is centered on what the center of the universe is centered on. Because God was there when time and space and matter and energy were invented. He's the one who invented them. It even says so in Proverbs chapter 3. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. Getting this right is also the foundation to answer every other important wisdom question that there is. What's the meaning of life? Where did I come from? Where am I headed? Why do I believe that science really is credible? How do I make moral decisions? All of this comes from the foundation of prime reality, of who God is and what he's like. And wisdom begins with standing in awe and fear and reverence of God. But if you do this, there's big consequences. Standing in awe and reverence of God means that everything in your life becomes wrapped around Him. That every decision that you make has to do with His awesome majesty and power. That He is now the King of the universe. And the way that you use your time, the way that you make your choices, the way that you invest your money, it all depends on your fear of the Lord. It all comes from that one single point. But it makes sense. Because if he spoke all of billions of stars into being, if he invented gravity and aerodynamics, if he made up the moral order, if he designed the human brain, all with the word of his power, then we should all live according to the wisdom that he's expressed to us. That's where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. When I was a kid, I uh, used to have uh, this old fangled invention called a record player. I know there's some people in this room who have no idea what a record player is, but it's the old version of a CD, and it had a turntable that went round and round and round at multiple different speeds with a stick that came up in the middle, and you would put your record on top of the turntable. There were three different speeds, 33, 45, and the fastest one was 78. And as kids, you find there are multiple uses for a record player that it doesn't only include playing records on the record player. And what we would love to do is we'd set up all different kinds of games and we'd like uh, to set up the uh, turntable, put it on 78 as fast as it could go, and then we would take the records and try and drop them so that the hole in the record went right on the stick of the turntable, right? And of course, sometimes it would go on, it would spin really fast, and that would be cool. Sometimes you would miss, and the turntable would spin, and, and you know, bonus points if you hit your little brother. That's the, that's the way that it would work. And what we found is it's so important to have the center of the record on the center of the turntable. Otherwise, everything doesn't work and your life spins out of control. And some people have done that with the LPs in their life. Look at this picture here. If you have security that is the center of your life and that little square is where you're trying to put on the middle of the LP and you want to try and find wisdom for God and relationships and love and money and recreation... Your life's going to be off-center and it's going to be sent in all kinds of wobbly directions and may zoom off the track. But if you get your life right and you put Jesus at the center of your life, well, not only do you find wisdom about God, but it puts you in the right perspective to find wisdom about relationships and love and money and how to live in this world and recreation, security. All of those things begin to fall into place because you've got the right thing that's in place in the center of your life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, God has written these deep laws into the fabric of the universe. And all of us need to align with the deep laws of God in order to connect with him and live according to wisdom. What you'll find 
is that if you're a wise person and if you seek God and fear him with all your heart, he not only gives you nuggets of wisdom, but he includes you into the story of the universe, the flow of how things are happening that begins all the way at creation and then there's people that were created and we weren't that wise and so we live life our way instead of God's way, sent into a state of rebellion that God has, in the, has been in the purpose of repurposing and redeeming from the point of that rebellion with its climax in Jesus who is himself the very wisdom and revelation of God. And when you meet him and get to know him and align with his purposes, he sets you on a new path and he begins to inhabit your life with his wisdom, building a kingdom that he wants to use you for his purposes. We get a hint of this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, which is in the New Testament after Jesus. Paul says this, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they might know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It all starts with Jesus because the mystery of God and all of wisdom and all of knowledge have been hidden in him from the beginning of time. And if you spend your life pursuing wisdom and you really, really want it, you'll land at Jesus. And if you spend time in your life loving Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, you'll find your life to be filled with wisdom. They lead to one another necessarily because of Jesus being the very wisdom of God. See, Jesus is redeeming you and he's redeeming this world. And he says, trust me in everything that you have and everything that you do. And if you trust me, I'll set you on that path, right, left, right, left, that moves towards wisdom. It's no wonder that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is perhaps the favorite and most memorized set of verses from the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus, the wisdom of God, and for giving us the book of Proverbs that leads us into all wisdom. Thank you that you love us, and that you died for us, and that you've given us new life, and that you give us wisdom to be able to live our lives by. And we pray for your power and strength to be lived through us, and that you would make us people who accumulate wisdom, and then live according to the wisdom of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.